All right, it's a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in person. And those of you joining us on Zoom, thank you um, for joining us for our May lunchtime expedition presentation. My name is Corey Anko. I am the curator of the Draper Natural History Museum. And up in our sound booth here uh, running our AV today is Amy Phillips, our curatorial assistant. So please give a big thank you to Amy for making sure that all this is running. Just a couple quick announcements before we get going. If you'd all do this with me, take your mobile cellular electronic device and turn that sucker all the way on silent or airplane mode. We'd greatly appreciate it, and so would our speaker. Um, if this is the first time you're joining us, uh, these lectures are being recorded, um, and they will be available on our YouTube channel. If you just go to youtube.com, you type in Draper Natural History Museum or Lunchtime Expedition Programs, you'll find our bearer icon. If you click on that, um, you'll get a bunch of playlists of all of our different videos, as well as our Layers with Larry Geology web series. Um, then you can click through and see presentations dating back to 2018. Um, so we have a, a wonderful wealth of uh, knowledge and speakers there. Um, we highly encourage you to check that out if there's a specific topic of interest that relates to the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem or um, as it pertains to research conducted with natural history museum collections. Um, please also feel free to invite friends and family to uh, attend these talks um, as you feel comfortable. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to offer these programs uh, for free. Um, thanks to generous sponsorship from Sage Creek Ranch and, Ranch and the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation. While many of our speakers are local, um, we do have several speakers that travel to provide these lectures, including our speaker today, um, which means we do cover those expenses associated with our travel and lodging. Um, if you feel compelled to donate or help support these programs and the Draper Naturalist Museum, please come find me or Amy um, after the lecture. Um, we're grateful to have all of you um, as supporters and sponsors who have year after year allowed us to bring um, these wonderful programs to the public. Um, so our quick trivia answers. Um, our first one was, what animal hair does this belong to? Did anybody get that one? Shout it out if you think you know it. Elk? Not elk. Nope. It was a pronghorn. Pronghorn. Um, and then the... Two billion years of rock missing outside of Cody is called what? The Great Unconformity. So if you want to learn more about the local geology and the historical biodiversity of the region, we highly encourage you to check out our YouTube series, Layers with Larry, to learn why those rocks are missing. So, and our final uh, trivia question was, today's range of Yellowstone cutthroat trout is what percent of their former range? This was from our April lunchtime expedition presentation. More than 10, less than that, 17, close enough, price is right. <laughs> well, today we are going to hear from Dr. Danielle Ulrich. Ulrich is a plant ecophysiologist and assistant professor in ecology at Montana State University. She investigates plant physiological responses to and interactions with their environments in forest, agricultural, and grasslands ecosystems to understand the physiological mechanisms underlying plant responses to environmental stress and future climates. Ulrich earned her bachelor's at Bowdoin, oh, should I ask you how to pronounce that? Bowdoin, doing? Bowdoin, tomato, potato? <laughs> Bowdoin College, thank you and her master's and PhD at Oregon State University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Los Alamos National Laboratory. In her spare time, you can find Dr. Ulrich in a forest mountain biking, telemark skiing, trail running, and whitewater rafting with her dog and partner. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Danielle Ulrich. Great, and thanks, Corey. Thanks for that introduction, and thank you all for being here today. Okay, okay. So we'll we'll just get started here. So I'm sure we all know that plants and vegetation and forests are incredibly valuable uh, for the ecosystem services they provide us with. They form the back the backbone of of many ecosystems. They provide us with food to eat. Uh, clean air to breathe, 
uh, clean water to drink, uh, beautiful places to recreate in, beautiful places to, to connect with, and I'm sure we all know that living in this greater Yellowstone region. So as a plant physiologist and as climates are getting warmer and drier, often in the Western, in the Western US, my research goal is to understand, mitigate, and predict the impacts of environmental stress, both abiotic and biotic stress, on plant function, survival, and mortality. And to do that, I quantify physiolog physiological responses to stress at the leaf level, the whole plant, and the landscape scale. And so just as we as humans go to the doctor to get our vital signs measured, our, our blood pressure, our heart rate, uh, growth, and weight, and height, as plant physiologists, we have a suite of tools and instruments we also can assess these vital signs in plants, um, such as how plants are doing photosynthesis, how are they using water, how are they using CO2. So my research at Montana State University has three main thrusts. The first being, being focused on seedling ecophysiology of high elevation pines, and that's what I'll share with you today. Uh, the second being plant microbe interactions, and the third being tree ecophysiology, so adult tree ecophysiology and forest hydrology. Before I jump in, none of this would be possible without my excellent team of graduate and undergraduate students. So the research I share with you today is, is uh, I could not do without them. And so I thank them very much for, their, uh, for all of their, their excellence and, and support through this. Okay, so we'll jump right in. So how many of you have heard or seen a whitebark pine or a limber pine? Okay, have you seen, have you seen them out, outside? Okay, yeah. Based on what you know about whitebark pine and limber pine, can you tell me which one is a whitebark pine and which one is a limber pine? We could start, let's start with the, the left, your left photo. Which one's that? Whitebark, white okay. Which, what about the, in the right is? is limber pine, okay. All right, well you are all better guessers than I am. Uh, so yeah, the one on the left is white bark, and this is limber pine on the right. And what, what we've noticed is that white bark and limber pine look awfully similar. They are often, uh, they can be confused and indistinguishable in the field, especially if they don't have cones. If they have cones, uh, white bark pine has purple cones and limber pine has green cones, so they're easier to distinguish. But if they don't have cones like this, you might make a mistake like me and not know which one's white bark and which one's limber. So they have a lot of similarities. Both white bark and limber pine are five needled pines, meaning that they, their needles come in fascicles or bundles of five needles. They are both, they both inhabit high elevations. Um, they are slow growing, very slow growing, and they are long lived. So white bark pine can live up to 1500 years old. Limber pine can live up to 3000 years old. Um, so they're long lived, five needle pines found at the, in these uh, high elevations that are often windy, dry, uh, bright, sunny, um, and often kind of harsh environments. White bark and limber pine also have overlapping geographic distributions shown in these maps here. So we have white bark on the, on the left and limber pine on the right. And you can see that white bark pine's distribution is larger and extends further north than limber pines does. Uh, here in Montana and, and Wyoming, uh, we have both white bark and limber pine. Both species are also ecologically important. Both species are considered both foundation species and keystone species. They are foundation species because they're often the first species that can establish at such high elevations. So they form habitat for other species. They, uh, they also protect, uh, provide protection for other species. They stabilize soil and they can maintain snowpack and stream flow throughout the growing season. White bark and limber pine are both keystone species, meaning that they're relatively rare in abundance but have an outsized impact on the ecosystems and organisms that rely upon them. So for example, the grizzly bear and the Clark's nutcracker shown here, both rely on the seeds of white bark pine and limber pine for food. The Clark's nutcracker has this mutualistic relationship with white bark pine and limber pine where it will, uh, it will feed on, on on the pine seeds uh, and cache them uh, while also dispersing the seeds of white bark and limber pine. So both species, white bark and limber, are also animal dispersed. Their seeds are animal dispersed. They are not wind dispersed. <laughs> 
So these pines look the same. They're both ecologically important. They're dispersed, dispersed in the same way. Unfortunately, both of these, these pines are declining at alarming rates. They are threatened by the same factors, but a suite of factors. They're threatened by white pine blis blister rust, oops, white pine blister rust shown in the top left here, uh, bark beetle on the bottom right, climate change and drought, top right, and wildfire on the bottom left. As such, both white bark and limber pine have been declared endangered under the Canadian Species at Risk Act. And here in the US, white bark pine was just recently listed as threatened under the US Endangered Species Act. And white bark, in fact, has the largest range of any tree species listed under the US Endangered Species Act. So to combat these declining pine populations, the primary restoration strategy that the Forest Service uses is outplanting rust resistant seedlings. And the seedling is arguably the most important developmental stage because the ability of a species to migrate or regenerate uh, depends on the successful establishment of these seedlings and depends on the successful uh, development from the seedling stage into juveniles, into reproductively mature trees. So se the seedling establishment stage is very, is very important. And a challenge to tree species migration and regeneration is that these younger developmental stages are often more vulnerable to stressors than adult trees. However, most of the research that has been done on these species focuses on adult tree species. We kind of ignore the seedling stage. So we don't know that much about what drives seedling establishment and seedling survival. We know a lot about what drives adult tree mortality, uh, what, what drives adult tree survival, but less so about seedlings. And so when we're trying to predict what will white bark pines distribution look like in the future? What will limber pines distribution look like under future climates? We are limited in our ability to do that because we've kind of ignored drivers of seedling establishment and survival. And so it's really important and critical that we focus on the seedling stage and understand what are these mechanisms that drive seedling survival and drive seedling mortality. And so that's where my lab's research comes in. Okay, so we've seen that white bark and limber pine have a lot of similarities. They look, look the same, even though you're all better than I am and could identify them. They look the same in the field. They are dispersed in the same way. They are threatened by the same suite of factors. But one way that they, they do differ is in their elevational distributions. So white bark pine is often found at higher elevations and with a narrow, narrower elevational band than limber pine. Because of this, white bark pine is considered a specialist species. It's good at specializing in these upper elevations. In contrast, limber pine is considered a generalist because it can inhabit both lower elevations and higher elevations. And therefore, it's considered a generalist because it can, uh, it can persist and thrive at both these lower elevations and, and these higher elevations where white bark can only persist or only seems to persist at these higher elevations. So we can see that here from this diagram of, of where we've got white bark, the specialist only at high elevations, and then limber pine, the generalist, at both low and high elevations. So this led my group to ask the question, why is this? Why is, what is it about limber pine that limber pine can persist at both low elevations and high elevations? What is it about white bark pine that it can only persist at high elevations? What, are the, uh, what is the how, what is the, um, what I'm most interested in, the mechanisms leading to that? What is, is there something special about limber pine that enable, enables it to be this generalist and inhabit this broader range of elevations? And so that brings me to the goal of the research that I'll share with you today, which is to understand the physiological mechanisms contributing to white bark pine as a specialist and limber as a generalist and those contrasting elevational distributions. So I mentioned these physiological mechanisms. What do I mean when I, when I say physiological mechanisms? Well, we know that trees and plants need sunlight, they need CO2, and they need water to do photosynthesis in their leaves. They can then make their own food. They can make their own sugars. 
and those sugars can be allocated to essential functions for survival, um, for survival and persistence. And those essential functions uh, can lead to faster growth or can lead to higher stress resistance. And so plants can allocate kind of to either of these two mechanisms. They can allocate resources to acquiring sunlight and water and CO2 for photosynthesis and faster growing. Or they can allocate more of their, their limited uh, sugars, their limited products of photosynthesis to slower growing, to being slower growing and having higher stress resistance. So both of these, the ability to, to acquire sunlight, water, and CO2, and being stress resistant can help a tree survive. So how do we measure these mechanisms, this acquiring of sunlight, water, and CO2, and the stress resistance? Well, we can measure, that, measure these or assess these mechanisms by measuring what we call traits. And so there are different types of traits that I, I've listed here that we can compare between species and what we compared between white bark and limber pine to better understand what are the mechanisms of why limber pines found at both low elevations and high elevations and why white bark's only found at high elevations. So when I mention more, let's see, do this. When I mentioned morpholo morphology, this top uh, trait type, I'm talking about uh, plant shape or the, um, the shape of its canopy. Some, some plants can have a, a very broad canopy of leaves where they're very good at taking up and taking in and absorbing sunlight. Uh, when I talk about biomass traits, I'm talking about the allocation of biomass either to above ground tissues, and those above ground tissues are good for photosynthesis where they can acquire sunlight, water, and CO2 and grow fast or some individuals will allocate their biomass below ground to roots that can help find water under drought stress conditions. And so that would make that individual with a greater root system more drought resistant or stress resistant. When I talk about this group of stomatal traits, I'm talking about stomata, which are these small pores. Um, it's, uh, stomata is the Greek word for tiny mouths. So there are small pores on leaves that are responsible for taking in CO2 for photosynthesis and drawing up water uh, to the leaves for photosynthesis. And so we can measure uh, different characteristics about, of these stomata, so like their size and how many there are. And if they're bigger and more of them, then we can say that that plant can take up more CO2 and water and is uh, better at this kind of top, this number one top strategy at acquiring sunlight, water, and CO2. Second to last here, I have bud burst phenology. And so when I talk about bud burst phenology, I'm referring to bud burst timing. So right now, at least in Bozeman, all the, all the trees have buds on them. They'll eventually, uh, they'll eventually grow, grow out into leaves, into leaves or needles. And we can assess the timing of that, uh, of that bud burst change from bud into needle elongation. So the earlier that, that a tree can put on leaves, the longer the growing season. Uh, the longer time that plant has to acquire sunlight, water, and CO2 to do fast, faster growth. And then finally, I, this trait category down here is high light, drought, heat, and cold tolerance. So this just refers to the resi stress resistances or resistances or tolerances to different environmental stressors like drought and heat and cold. So we can compare these traits between species to understand is white bark pine better at acquiring sunlight, water, and CO2, uh, or is it better at being stress resistant compared to limber pine, and vice versa? So what we can do with these mechanisms of being a faster grower and good at acquiring water, CO2, and, and, and sunlight uh, versus stress resistance is put them on a continuum, where on one end we have this kind of faster growth, um, plants that are have traits that enable them to acquire a lot of light, water, and CO2 to grow fast. And then on the other end, we have this kind of slower, slower, growth, uh, slower growth strategy or mechanism um, where those individuals have high stress resistance. So we can put these mechanisms on either end of a continuum and we can pair them with traits. And so we characterize these traits as being fast or acquisitive traits, so traits that help a plant acquire more sunlight, more water, CO2. And we can also, on the other end of the spectrum, 
we can categorize these traits as slow or conservative traits. Um, they promote kind of slow growth, but are really good at helping the plant endure stress to resist or tolerate stress. And on top of that, we can overlay what we know about life history strategies, such as being a generalist and specialist. So kind of linking this back to our white bark and limber pine where a specialist that's good at inhabiting a narrow range of environments would specialize in either having fast traits, being a fast grower and having these fast traits, or being, uh, um, being more stress resistant and having these slower, more conservative traits. Whereas in contrast, a generalist could span that whole spectrum and have traits that enable it to be both a fast grower and stress resistant. So if we match this, pair this with our white bark pine, limber pine system, we expect that white bark's a specialist because it lives at just those high elevations and limber pine's that generalist that can live at both low and high elevations. And so we would expect that white bark pine as a specialist would excel at or be better at or have, have traits that would pro promote this slow or conservative life history strategy of, of being more stress resistant and and be able to persist at those high elevations that are often very cold, very stressful. And in contrast, we would expect that limber pine, the generalist, would exhibit both fast and slow traits, both, both traits that can in, that allow it to inhabit a greater range of elevations than white bark pine. So paired together, it looks something, something like this. So this brings me to the research question that we'll be discussing today. So we looked at how do traits differ between white bark and limber pine given their contrasting elevational distributions and their respective generalist specialist strategies. So we hypothesize that limber pine will exhibit a generalist strategy, right? That will have both fast acquisitive and slow conservative traits, allowing it to inhabit a broader range of elevations than white bark. We expect that the two species will not differ in their slow or conservative traits, enabling them both to persist at those higher elevations. And finally, we expect limber will exhibit more fast or acquisitive traits than white bark that enables limber to persist at lower elevations as well. So kind of some of these hypotheses are kind of summarizing that last, that last diagram. Okay. So what, what did we do? I'll give you kind of a brief, brief overview uh, of, of how we uh, investigated this question. So first we obtained five-year-old limber pine and white bark pine seedlings from the U.S. Forest Service Coeur d'Alene Nursery. The Coeur d'Alene Nursery grows these species from seed to be outplanted on, uh, on ranger districts. Um, they grow these rust-resistant seeds, uh, seedlings from seed, um, and they were generous enough to donate them to my research, and for that I'm very thankful. And so we transplanted these bare root seedlings to containers and grew them in the greenhouse at Montana State University, shown here. This is a master, a former master student, Chloe Wassonies, here in the greenhouse with those seedlings. This map shows the geographic distribution of white bark pine in blue, and the geographic distribution of limber pine in pink. And the circles indicate the seed source locations of the five-year-old seedlings we obtained from the Coeur d'Alene Nursery. So we received two families of each species indicated by each circle. The, uh, the, climate, the climate conditions of both of those seed source locations within each species and between species were quite similar. So this is a table showing elevation, precipitation, minimum temperature, maximum temperature, and vapor pressure deficit. And you don't need to read the numbers, but the, the climate conditions of all four seed source locations were very similar. And so for today, what we focus on is focusing on white bark pine and limber pine comparisons rather than within species comparisons. Okay, so I mentioned these physiological mechanisms. We put them on a continuum, and I mentioned all of these types of traits and these are the traits that we measured. So first we measured morphology. Again, a morph kind of is another word for form or for shape. And for this, we, we focused on the crown or the canopy of each seedling. And we're able to make various measurements characterizing the needle arrangement, the branching arrangement, the crown architecture of each of the seedlings. 
These are example five-year-old seedlings from this research of white bark pine and limber pine, and you can see just by looking at them, they look very different. Limber pine on the right has um, more densely packed needles, more densely packed foliage up top, and it looks like maybe it has more needles as well uh, compared to, to white bark pine. So we have uh, various metrics that we can measure to assess, uh, to assess and compare the crown morphology between the species. We also measured biomass, oops, which, uh, which when I refer to biomass, we measured total biomass of each seedling, but also measured the biomass of roots, stems, and needles. So we separated out the roots, stems, and needles, um, put them in these paper bags on the far right, uh, let them dry in a drying oven, and then weighed them for their dry mass. And from these biomass measurements, we can get a sense of how does each species allocate, uh, allocate biomass to needles, to stems, to roots? Again, if, if, uh, if an individual or a species allocates more to needles, it might be better at, at, at taking up CO2 and water and sunlight for photosynthesis and growing faster, while an individual or species that allocates more biomass to roots may be more drought resistant, may be better at uptaking, uptaking water during times of drought stress. I mentioned stomatal traits. So stomata are those small pores on leaves that take up CO2 and water for photosynthesis. So we focused in on these fascicles of needles of these five needle pines, and we took imprints of stomata and visualized the stomata under a microscope. And so that's what I'm showing you here. These are microscope images of those small pores of those stomata. And the stomata come in two rows, as you see a top row and a bottom row in both limber pine and white bark pine. And we can measure the size of the stomata, how many stomata there are, and if there are more larger stomata, we can say that that species is better at taking up CO2, water, and sunlight than uh, compared to another species. We also measure, measure this bud burst phenology, or this bud burst timing. And we established six stages of bud burst shown here that are based on this Martinez Berdea paper. Um, and these stages span the tight bud uh, in the top uh, over here, the tight, uh, tight bud at stage, stage one, um, bud swelling, stage three, all the way to needle elongation at stage six. And so what we did was we weekly monitored which bud burst stage each seedling was at throughout the spring. And so we were able to determine the number of days it took to reach, say, needle elongation. So the more days it took, uh, the more delayed that, that needle elongation was. And so the shorter that growing season would be. And a, a shorter growing season would, be, would mean less time to take up CO2 and water and sunlight for fast growth. And so this work was led by former undergraduate student Franklin, Franklin Alonji. And he's shown here in this photo, and he came up with this measurement scheme of, of corresponding a zip dye color with each of the six bud burst stages, and then went into the greenhouse weekly and assessed every single seedling weekly um, to, uh, and put a different color zip tie on a seedling depending on what bud burst stage it was at. So from there, we were able to determine the number of days it took to get to needle elongation. And then our final set of measurements here are these stress resistance, those kind of slow traits, those stress resistant traits. So um, tolerance to cold, heat, drought, and light. And we measured these with a variety of methods, um, uh, namely using this uh, portable photosynthesis instrument here, we were able to measure the effect of these stressors on photosynthesis and then also on cellular damage. So that's, this is the portable photosynthesis system where we can clamp foliage into the cuvette of that system and measure photosynthesis. This is a pressure chamber that we use to measure drought tolerance uh, where we can, visualize, we can visualize the stem, the cut stem of an individual and be able to assess its, its water status or how drought stressed it is. And then this is just one snapshot of some cold tolerance measurements, some seedlings that were exposed to a cold treatment to measure cold tolerance. Okay, so what did we find? I'm gonna highlight some key results. There were so many things that we measured, so I'll only, I'll spare you 
the details and only, <laughs> only share some highlights. So we measured all of these traits, as, as you, you recall. And first we'll start with traits that corresponded with this first strategy of acquiring sunlight, water, and CO2. And then second, we'll focus on those stress resistance traits. So first, for the ability to acquire sunlight, we found that a suite of traits, um, maximum saturating light level, fascicle density, ratio of sunlight, sunlit to total leaf area, those are kind of morphology measurements. Um, and together, these three measurements tell us about how well light adapted each species was. And taken together, these results tell us that limber pine was more high light adapted than white bark pine. Or in other words, that limber pine was better at acquiring sunlight than white bark pine. For the ability to acquire water and CO2, we looked at stomatal density and area, so stomatal density and size, these top two plots here, and found that limber pine had more larger stomata, indicating that limber pine was able to take up more CO2 and water for, for photosynthesis. We also were able to measure CO2 uptake and found that limber pine was able to take up significantly more CO2 than, limber, than white bark pine. And then finally, our bud, birth, bud burst measurements showed us that limber pine reached needle elongation much sooner, earlier in the growing season than white bark pine, meaning that it was able to take up water and CO2 and do photosynthesis earlier in the season and may possibly over a longer growing season than white bark pine. So taken together, all of these measurements are suggesting that limber pine had a greater ability to acquire water and CO2 than white bark pine. And then our final, our final result slide here is focusing on those slow conservative traits, the stress resistance traits. And so this table uh, presents the, drought, uh, the results from our drought tolerance, heat tolerance, and cold tolerance measurements, which you do not have to read. Because what we found was that measurements of drought, heat, and cold tolerance did not significantly differ between species. And so in other words, we can say that stress resistance between, or between white bark and limber pine did not significantly differ, or they did not, they did not, one was not greater than the other. Okay, so what is this, how does this relate to our framework that we had kind of set up previously? So what we found was that limber pine had a greater ability, a greater, uh, greater capacity to take up sunlight, water, and CO2. And that's what I show on the, on the left here. That limber pine uh, was, had traits that promoted faster growth, uh, or these fast acquisitive traits. On the other end of the spectrum, what we found was that white bark pine and limber pine did not differ in their cold, heat, and drought tolerances, suggesting that both, both species exhibited slow or conservative traits. So what we see is this, uh, this limber pine as the generalist showed both, both fast and slow traits, showed both ends of the spectrum, while, as, well, while white bark pine did not significantly differ from limber pine and also showed this slow, this slow trait, this slower growing strategy. Okay, so in summary, what did we find? We found that limbers, limber pine's fast and slow traits contributed to its generalist strategy and its ability to inhibit, inhabit that greater range of elevations than white bark pine. Limber had greater fast or acquisitive traits than white bark, including a, a greater capacity to take up sunlight, carbon, and water. In contrast, the slow conservative traits, the other end of the spectrum, did not significantly differ between species, enabling both white bark and limber to persist at those higher elevations. So, what, in other words, what, what might this mean? This, this might mean that limber pine may make more efficient use of high sunlight loads and maximize carbon and water uptake and faster growth, 
when moisture is abundant uh, during possibly spring snow melt before the onset of dry summer conditions. And we say that limber pine may be better at taking up moisture and high light and carbon uh, during spring snow melt because it had that earlier bud burst timing. It's limber pine's needle elongation happened earlier in the season compared to white bark pine. So what we saw was that comparing the physiology of white bark and limber pine within the same environment, so in controlled greenhouse conditions, enabled us to identify physiological mechanisms that may underlie their species establishment and survival, and how juvenile or seedling physiology contributes to their contrasting distributions and their generalist specialist strategies. Okay. So this work that I just presented you, to you today um, is, a, is under review, which I'm very excited about, and has also formed the foundation for a lot of our future and ongoing work in the lab that I wanna spend some time sharing. We have a lot of exciting directions uh, for future work um, that I'm looking forward to sharing with you today. So we have, a, a, again, I'll re revisit my great team of graduate students who are doing awesome work, um, all of them doing different different types of work but related to white bark and limber pine, high elevation pines. So building off of this white bark limber pine comparison work that I just showed you, we wanted to then know how do these species respond to drought? If we impose an experimental drought, how do, how do they respond? And so that's what PhD student Sean Hoy Skubik is doing where he imposed a drought treatment to white bark and limber pine, measured a slew of physiological variables um, to see how they responded. He imposed a severe enough drought that some of them died and some of them, um, and some of them survived in the control treatment. So some, some droughted plants were what he called crispy or ended up dying, on what you see on the left, um, while some, uh, while the control plants remained happy and green, as you can see on the right. And so, of course, as physiologists, we wanted to know why. What about, what was the underlying mechanism for why this, why this individual turned crispy versus this other individual that, that stayed happy. And so what Sean's been looking at is carbohydrates in plants, so those products of photosynthesis. And what he found was that the plants that were crispy and ended up dying had lower starch content or lower carbohydrate content than the happy surviving plants. So this suggested to us that if we can measure carbohydrate content in plants, we might be able to predict what individuals will survive drought or die during drought. And being able to have that predictive power is incredibly useful for predicting future species distributions under warmer, drier climates. So this seemed like this carbohydrate, these carbohydrate measurements could be a way that we can predict whether a tree will die or survive. And so Sean's next, next steps are to, uh, to use remote sensing technologies. Um, we found that you can remotely sense plant carbohydrates, and if you can remotely sense plant carbohydrates, then we might be able to remotely sense the plant car carbohydrates to predict drought survival and mortality. So we're really excited about that work, and that's kind of a, a, a new avenue to scale up our, our individual physiology measurements up to a broader, bigger spatial scale. Master's students Katie Sparks and Jess Harris uh, have also looked at the effect of drought on these high elevation pine species. They were able to use kind of employ this new drought method and, and impose a more gradual drought, which we kind of see here. They measured a bunch of different physiological measurements, including photosynthesis that I show here, um, as well as looking at different measurements that we hadn't measured yet, like xylem anatomy. Um, and so xylem is the structure of plants that take up water. And so what we're looking at here is a cross section of a stem visualized under a microscope. And so we can measure different traits, kind of like with the stomata, we can measure different traits of the xylem, of the water transporting organ of trees, uh, and compare them to better understand how a species will respond to drought. So uh, another line of exciting work is expanding the work that I shared with you today from the greenhouse and bringing it out into the field. Um, so PhD student Lou Deloisi is leading this work where she's selected field sites throughout the greater Yellowstone ecosystem to go out and measure mature 
white bark pine and limber pine in the field. So what I presented to you today was white bark pine and limber pine seedlings in the greenhouse. Uh, and, and so we're excited that we could finally go out and measure mature trees in the field. And so these are two maps of two sites that she's tentatively selected. One at, um, at the, the top here is Mile, Mile Creek by Hebgen Lake, and then this is uh, Teton Pass down by Jackson. Um, and we're building on some previous work that has genetically identified white bark and limber pine. Because as we started this talk off uh, with, I tried to make the case that white bark pine and limber pine can be difficult to distinguish in the field if they don't have cones. So if we were to go out and measure white bark and limber in the field, we might not know which one's which. So we built off this previous work by Andy Hansen um, and Matt Lab and others at Montana State University who genetically identified white bark and limber in the field. And so that's what these maps are showing here where the green balloons are white bark pine identified trees and the red balloons are limber pine trees. And so Lou's gonna go out and measure the physiology throughout several growing seasons uh, and measure and compare the physiology of these mature trees and compare them, get to compare the species in the field. So that's something we're really excited about. Master student Tio Rautu uh, is looking at the impacts of white bark pine mortality on hydrology, looking at the impacts of white bark pine mortality on snowpack and stream flow. You know, I started this talk off saying that white bark pine helps to maintain uh, and protect snowpack and stream flow. We often say that for of high elevation pine species because it makes sense. These, these species can shade snowpack, can kind of slow down and retain snowpack um, and snow melt, but not many people have actually measured this, have actually confirmed, confirmed this. And so that's what Tio's work is kind of centered around and, and what she is setting out to do. And so she's, she's comparing, or she's using a suite of measurements, field measurements and modeling to better understand when white bark are there, uh, when, or when white bark are removed from the system, how does that affect the hydrology? So she's selected various field sites throughout the greater Yellowstone region. These are two maps from Hood Creek uh, um, and Highlight outside Bozeman. Um, the one on the, the right is from Beehive Basin, Basin by Big Sky. And she selected these field sites and is making various field measurements of stream flow, of canopy cover, and pairing these field measurements with a water balance model to be able to pinpoint how will white bark pine mortality affect snowpack and stream flow. And these are fun photos from Tio's field work and some nice white bark. making some, some snow measurements, and also some stream flow measurements. And then finally, master student Steve Heisman is using a, a mixture of modeling and mapping to create better maps to more directly, to direct suitable planting locations for, for outplant, outplanting these rest resistant seedlings. So I had said that a primary restoration strategy was outplanting seedlings, but how do we know where to do that? Should we be planting them where white bark used to be? Should we be planting white bark where it will fare best under future climates? And so what Steve is doing is creating map layers of, of different filters to white bark pine establishment. So specifically things like white pine blister rust at the top there, wildfire, drought, bark beetle. So creating maps of, of, of locations that, are, that have a high risk of, of rust, of wildfire, of drought, of bark beetle, and layering those maps and creating a map of the union of all of those filters, of all of those, um, those, those factors that can limit white bark pine establishment to create a more accurate map um, and map suitable planting locations for white bark pine. So that when we are out planting these seedlings, we could plant them more efficiently uh, to ensure their success. Um, the seedlings, to outplant the seedlings, it's time consuming, it's resource consuming, and so we wanna do that most efficiently and hopefully with a map that Steve's creating, we can do that. And so with that, I thank you all for your attention. Um, I thank uh, a lot, all of these uh, funding sources, the Montana State University Plant Growth Center uh, Greenhouse, a great team of grad students and undergrad students and collaborators, and um, 
and thank you again for attending, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Sure, yeah, yeah, so that was a great question. The question was about the uh, carbohydrate study that I mentioned at the end there. Um, and if we could use, car uh, if we can measure carbohydrates in different, in different, in seedlings from different seed sources, perhaps we could better, more accurately predict or accurately pick seed sources to be outplanting. If we know, right, if they have a higher carbohydrate content and might uh, be better suited to survive a drought. Is that, that's kind of the gist of, of the question, yeah. Um, so that's a great question and definitely, um, definitely something, something that we want to pursue because that, that's a, a, main, a main point of it. If we, can, if we can identify seedlings that will be more successful, then yes, we should absolutely be propagating those and focusing on those to outplant. So definitely uh, something, yeah, that we'll, we would like to pursue and definitely a good use of that tool for sure. Yes. So the question was, should we be planting, could, could we be planting more limber pine um, because they might be a, a little more efficient at taking up CO2, uh, would, that be, would that be helpful? Um, I guess that dep depends on our, our goals, I guess our management goals. Um, uh, I'd say, and I guess in my, personal, in my personal opinion, I think that, um, yeah, because white bark and limber can persist in the same, same types of environments, we might start to see more, more limber. Um, I know some, some folks are thinking about outplanting limber, but really the focus has been white bark pine because white bark pine has been seeing more, a greater decline than limber pine. But given all of their similarities, we might start considering that more. Although, yeah, um, it could be a controversial topic um, d depending, depending on one's goals, I guess. If it, True. Yes. Yeah. And I, uh, I would, I would agree with that. That yeah, at lower lower elevations, often in drier, warmer climates, limber pine does do better, and we do, we do generally see that in in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and so that would apply in in Cody too. Yeah. I'm wondering something we're talking about with with Steve, this la that last project I mentioned, the mapping project, is um, identifying what we call micro refugia, or these kind of small pockets of climate that may be found at lower elevations, but actually. For due to due to hydrology and due to cold air drainage, they might actually be conducive to white bark pine at lower elevations. But we just can't. We just haven't been able to m most accurately identify those locations. But, but generally, yeah, cold yeah cold temperature. Uh, seem seem white bark seems to do better at colder temperatures and less well at warmer temperatures so if we could find those kind of pockets of cold air um, or those colder temperatures or, or drainages that seem to be colder in temperature due to topography and terrain then maybe we could be planting white bark at lower elevations but generally i agree with you that yeah generally limber pine would do better in these uh, lower elevations with warmer warmer drier temperatures or warmer drier climates yeah
excuse me, yeah, so that was a great question about whether or not Whitebark and Limber have different uh, times, require different different times to reach reproductive maturity. And I don't, I don't know offhand how similar they are. My impression would be that they are quite similar. Um, I know white bark's around 50 years. It will become re reproductively mature and can start producing cones. Um, and so I, my guess is that limber pine is similar, but I could be wrong. Um, but I, that's a good point. If, if one is, is better at producing cones, then yeah, that would definitely help with our restoration. Totally, two great questions. So the first question was, um, what is the percentage of remaining white bark, uh, uh, remaining white bark forest? And I believe it's at least half. I don't know. I don't know specifically, but in this, at least in this region, in recent studies, um, at, at least half have have been have been gone or are, are remaining, but half have have died. Um, so the and this has been happening over decades. Um, and being listed this year, it's been a candidate species for a while, so it's been, been a long time coming for white bark to be listed. And then the second part was, uh, oh, the, um, a, yeah, the second question was kind of how, um, if we, how will it go if we plant seedlings in the same locations or the, within white bark's current range, right? So within white bark's current range, climate conditions are predicted to get warmer, warmer and drier. And so I would say that planting white bark where they are now would, would not be the most successful strategy. I think we should be thinking further, further ahead in the future um, based on current predictions of climate. It's, it seems to be getting, especially in our, the greater Yellowstone area, it's gonna be warmer and drier. And if we pursue, if we put a lot of time and effort and resources into planting white bark in their current locations, I don't think they'll be that successful. Do you think that some white bark are genetically variant enough to survive some of the factors that are killing the most of the other species? That some species will survive? Yes. Uh, so the question was, is, genetic, or is white bark gen genetically diverse enough to survive, to, for some of them to survive? And, and yeah, and so I should say that the, the the biggest threat to white bark is white pine blister rust. And white bark does not, we have not yet identified a gene uh, associated with rust resistance, whereas for other white pines we have identified a gene. For example, limber pine does have a gene associated with rust resistance. But white bark pine, there's, it's more of a, a qualitative resistance where um, we will go out into the field, see where there's a bunch of, of, of rust, and some trees will will be fine, will be healthy and look fine and not be infected or have any symptoms, whereas other trees will be dead. Um, and so from those um, seeming like rust resistant trees, that's where we're taking those seeds and, and the Coeur d'Alene nursery is growing them from seed to be rust resistant seedlings. So there is definitely diversity in the genetics to be rust resistant to survive that stressor, for example. Um, I think what something we don't know is kind of if we're just planting these rust resistant seedlings, are we, are we going to lose any, anything else um, in terms of genetic diversity? Maybe in terms of drought resistance, something like that, that we just don't quite know. But since rust is the main threat right now, that's what we're focusing on. One from online here. Um, is your lab, or are you doing any work to understand past fluctuations due to these factors to better predict what limber and white bark pine will do in the you've alluded to that already, but. Uh, so yeah, so the question was uh, about, if I'm look, yeah, looking at how, doing any retrospective studies. I'm, I think, um, I mean, down the road, it's something that, something that we, we have talked about as a lab um, a little bit is maybe do, possibly doing some tree ring work and using tree rings to kind of reconstruct how did climate change and how did white bark, mature white bark and limber pine respond to different climate fluctuations. Um, so that's something that one of my PhD students has, has talked about doing um, at, the, at those field sites, um, the Mile Creek and possibly Teton Pass sometime, sometime in the future. Um, but that's a really good question and a really good, a really good project idea.
blister rust affects uh, wet bark pine and umber pine. Um, the bark beetle, is it the same species uh, affecting trees here that we find in other parts um, of North America, like Southwest and the Colorado Plateau and New Mexico, or is, is it a suite of species? Uh, here, uh, the, the, the bark beetle species here in fact infects other species throughout the western U.S., um, but there are many different types of bark beetle species, so it's not the same, it's not the same one for all, all species throughout the west, and definitely different than, say, pinionips that's in, that's in the southwest. Um, so it's definitely a, a, depends on the tree species you're talking about. Yeah. Another one from online here. Uh, if you're familiar with the region of Beehive Basin in the Spanish Peaks area, the um, question is, are both species, white bark and number pine, found there or only one? At least at TO sites, it's just white bark pine, as far as I know. Yeah, but I, yeah, that doesn't mean limber pine is not there. But um, I'm not super familiar with with the region specifically. But good question. Yeah. So when you step back and kind of give it the big picture, I was looking at the conserving traits. Are you comfortable that that's what you're seeing in the field, and that's what your study is showing? And if it's not. Are there some other characteristics that you need to be using or analyzing to see? Because in my brain, I always think of white bark growing higher elevation. It's hard to tell in your chart if it really did exceed the, uh, the limber. But so in your study, you indicated that they're both equal in their ability. But is that really what you, is that also what you see on the ground? And if it's not, what other factors could be out there that could be um, part of that discussion? Yeah, so great question about uh, if kind of the seedling results that I presented today of, of, of both white bark and limber pine having these slower conservative traits, do we see that in the field? And so currently, I don't know. And that's what we're kind of gearing up to do starting this summer is to go out and, co and directly compare the species, these types of traits in the field. And so that's something we'll be thinking about. So I don't know if right, right now, but we should know uh, maybe by next year. We could check so in next we, year. So am I incorrect? It's hard to tell in the chart, but will limber grow as high in elevation as white bark? It can't, yeah, so the question was, can limber pine grow as high as white bark pine? And it definitely can grow as high as white bark pine. Uh, limber pine can grow as high as white bark pine. And sometimes in some, some areas, like the bridgers, you'll actually see them flipped, um, where limber pine you'll find a little higher than white bark, which is due to another factor that I didn't address, but soil type, that limber pine likes this kind of calcareous limestone soils and will be found there, even if it's at higher, slightly higher elevation. But broadly in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, what we see is, is kind of this trend where we have more of the red limber pine balloons at, at lower elevations that then transition to the green white bark pines at higher, at higher elevations. But in, I mean, to also another layer of, to your question, to answer your question is depending on, or the distributions of white bark and limber pine span many latitudes. And so where, where high elevation is considered, uh, you know, further south maybe is uh, is different than where we might consider it up here. So another thing to another another wrinkle. Yes. Yeah. Question is limber pine seed. Are limber pine seeds also important for wildlife, just like white bark? And yes, the limber pine seeds are are very similar to white bark, and they are just as um, uh, yeah, they're uh, just as nutritious as white bark pine seeds and will be dispersed by Clark's nutcracker, will be eaten and, and used as a food source just or by the grizzly bear, by the red squirrel in the, in the same way, yeah. And pinion jays too. Don't forget about the pinion jays. And pinion jays. They're important. Got another one from online. We promise we'll stop firing away, but thank you for being such a good sport. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and thank you all for the incredible questions you guys are asking. Um, does slope, uh, northern or southern slope, mm. influence uh, distribution? That's a great question. Does slope, yeah, does uh, north or south aspect affect distribution? And I, I don't know offhand. Um, I would guess that yes, um, that we, again, we'd find white, uh, limber pine more on um, southern, southern um, warmer, drier, arid slopes uh, than, than white bark pine. But yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know offhand, and that's a good question. Last 
the question was about the mechanism that Clark's Nutcracker uses to store the seeds. Um, and so, yes, that is, that is definitely off my specialty. But my understanding is that they have the, a specialized beak that can chip away and get in get, and access the seeds of these kind of hard cones. So they'll, and then they'll store those cones or, or get at those cones with their beaks and then cache them um, anywhere under a log or under a rock. So you'll see seedlings starting to sprout out under, under these what we call nurse objects or these, these rocks or this stump. And so that's, that's the extent of my knowledge of, of Clark's so Nutcracker. Yeah, they often remember, or, or, um, yeah, my understanding. Right. Yeah, they can catch tens of thousands of seeds and they'll remember it for up to about six months. Um, every single one of those caches, they have something called hippocampus elasticity, where their hippocampus will swell. That's the part of the brain that's responsible for memory retention. Um, and then after that, uh, um, after it swells, or after about six months, it starts to shrink and they will lose track of those sites. And so that can result in regeneration. You didn't, you didn't Nutcrackers, yes. They do. So they have to come back the next year. They will probably have forgotten where the caches for the previous one. Yeah, yeah, previous one, yeah. I mean, they may use the similar sites uh, depending on how confined to a specific home range they may be. Um, but uh, there is a really unique study by Tombeck, um, Diane Tombeck, we have her as a presenter. So any of you that have been legacy attendees here may have caught Diana's uh, presentation. Um, but where she talked about how nutcrackers have influenced the genetic distribution of white bark pine stems based on the planting of nutcrackers, or planting of seeds by nutcrackers. Um, and then the last question from online was, how many trees did you use in your greenhouse study? Oh, how many trees did we use? I'm trying to remember. Um, so w uh, when, we, when we obtained these seedlings, we, uh, we obtained white bark limber and actually great basin bristle cone as well. So we had kind of three species of five-year-olds, and then we also had two-year-olds and three-year-olds of white bark pine. And for all of those, it was somewhere in upwards of 500, 600 seedlings to start. Um, but I can't remember offhand specifically just for this study. Yeah. That is, that is yeah. a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Well, Daniel, yeah. th thank you so much for your time, your expertise. Thank you yeah. Much. Yeah, thank you. Great. And join us in June uh, for our next lunchtime expedition a presentation with David Haynes, who will be discussing uh, golden eagle nesting ecology in Yellowstone National Park. So we'll see you all soon. <laughs>